Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for today. God, we come with different types of weeks, different types of mornings, some that may cause us to be distracted this morning. So Lord, I pray that as we continue to worship you through the opening of your word, through the preaching of your word, that we, that you, by your spirit, would just focus our hearts and our minds. God, by your spirit, help me to preach this sermon with the necessary power and appropriate affection. Lord, please use this sermon to bring glory to your name, joy to your people, and salvation to the lost. Amen. We're continuing on in our sermon series today in Colossians. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open them to Colossians. There we go. Colossians 1, 21 to 23 is what we'll be focusing on today as we continue on our sermon series looking at the preeminence of Christ in Colossians. Last week, Pastor Kevin brought us through the passage that essentially makes our sermon series title, looking at the preeminence of Christ. And Paul continues that train of thought as he begins to narrow his thought process from preeminence of Christ over everything and how Christ is restoring all things to him now he, Paul focuses his attentions on the Colossians as individuals and us as well. But as I was reflecting upon this message, for some reason, as many of you know, my mind often wanders, and I began to think of movies because that's what I like to do. Megamind came to mind. Giant blue character right on the front of the poster there. Cartoon. Some of you guys are like, I've never heard of that. If you have kids, probably they've watched it. In Megamind, there's basically a story bef- that revolves around two characters. One of them is Megamind. He is the villain of the story in Metro Man, and he's the hero of the story. And from the very beginning of the movie, you see that all Megamind wants to do is to defeat Metro Man from their birth all the way over into the movie. That's all he wants to do. Every ounce of what he does, his very existence is one to defeat Metro Man. Everything. In his evil lair, there's plans and posters and, 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 and processes of, of how he, he's conniving and, and thinking through his mind of how he's going to defeat Metro Man. Every part of him wants to defeat him. There's not one ounce of who he is that doesn't want to overcome Metro Man. And as I was thinking about this passage, this is what Paul is trying to show us today, especially in verse 21. As Paul begins to narrow the focus of what Christ has done on the cross for reconciling all things to himself, he focuses specifically on how God has reconciled the Colossians to himself. First, by describing who they were. He wants us, as we read this letter to the Colossians, for us to also reflect upon who we were. That we were the nemesis to God, constantly at war with Him. So, who we were. As verse 21 says, and you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Who are you in the sight of God before Christ? You were alienated. You were persistently in that state of separation from God. This is who you were. The word here is talking about how the Colossians were estranged from God. But more than that, they weren't just estranged, but they were persistently in that state. Constantly there. They were not hopping in and, so, in, in and out of two different worlds. They were constantly in a world that was alienated from a holy God. 
When Paul uses this term alienated, he wants us to understand that the Colossians and any of us who are outside of Christ are outside the sphere of God's blessing. The Colossians didn't serve God at all. There was no part of them that even desired to serve God. They were created for obedient fellowship with God, but God's design was spoiled by sin as Adam and Eve sinned against the holy God and sin entered into all creation like a poison, like a cancer. So the result is that the Colossians were hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Hostile in mind is another way of saying it. They were enemies. They were in open rebellion against the holy God. Not only were they alienated, because of their alienation before a holy God, they were in open rebellion against God and who he is. They were actively doing this. They are acting in open enmity towards God with reference to their thinking and their total conduct, all of who they were. They didn't want anything to do with God. And not only did they not want to do anything about God, but they were working in the complete opposite direction. They were alienated. They were hostile in mind. And because of their hostility in mind, they were doing evil deeds. Their thinking came out in their lives. We know this all well too well. What is inside of you comes out. Whatever you put in comes out. And for the Colossians, who they were, were people who were in open rebellion against the holy God. This is who they were. So every part of them, all their thinking came out in their lives. This is the kind of thinking that naturally finds visible expression in active behavior. Godlessness naturally leads to evil actions. So because of their alienation, that affects who they were. Their deeds were evil. Who they are is against God. Their actions are against him. The Colossians were enemies of God because their mind was to do evil. Think about it this way. Jesus says this in Matthew 7. As he speaks to his disciples in Matthew 7 verse 16, he says, You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every part of who they were. Paul is trying to hammer this point, was against God. So here, the mind produced fruit of action. And Paul wants us to see that it is important to remind ourselves as believers in Christ of our past lives. Not something that constantly gives us guilt, but to simply remind us Because this is, Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way. It is an essential part of the gospel that conviction must always precede conversion. The gospel of Christ condemns before it releases. You must come to the full realization of who you are before a holy God, before you can understand why it is indeed good news. The church is really bad with this when we talk about the gospel with our friends and our neighbors. We always jump to, hey, don't you want to get to heaven? Well, yeah. But heaven doesn't look that good if you don't understand how bad hell is. You were alienated from God. You were hostile in mind. The only thing that you are deserving of is eternal damnation in hell. Now, in Canada, we complain about so many things, about our rights. Right? I almost started complaining the other day. I found out that OHIP is now taking back my children's, whatever they call it, drug plan. I went, what? I deserve that. No, I don't. I deserve hell. And Paul wants us to, rem- he wants us to remember this. Because the gospel becomes even sweeter. The more aware we are of what hell is. And it also pushes us out into this world. 
I think in some of our conversations I've had with friends, friends who are, are gifted with evangelism, we often, I'm not gifted with that. I seek to evangelize, but I'm not an evangelist. And why don't we ever reach out with the gospel? Why is it the norm within the church not to tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because that is the norm. Most people don't. And someone once offered this thing to me. It's because we don't have a true realization of how bad hell is. Because if I truly understood how bad hell is, and I truly love my neighbor, oh, I would be telling them about the gospel. Because it's the only thing that saves them. It's the only thing that saves me. Paul comes, and he says this. As Martin Lloyd-Jones says, it is an essential part of the gospel that conviction must always precede conversion. That the gospel of Christ condemns before it releases, and Paul wants us to see that today. The good news of Jesus is incomplete without the bad news of sin. But thank you, God, for salvation by grace through faith in Christ. That those who have faith in Jesus, those who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, will be saved. Because as Paul continues on, the gospel doesn't just end with condemnation. Jesus offers certain salvation. And we have no reason to be swayed from the hope of the gospel. So Paul says to you and to me, this is who you were. But this is who you are through Christ. As he continues on in verse 22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you what's holy and blameless and above reproach before him. The NIV uses this word but now. And we all know that one of my biggest theological words is three letters but. This is who you were. But this is what God has done for you. It stresses the sharp contrast between believers' former condition and their current relationship with God. Christ has made possible their being reconciled to God. In Christ's voluntary suffering and death for others, God made salvation available to all who would place their faith in Christ. God's purpose in offering reconciliation through Christ's death was to make believers holy, blameless, and above reproach before a holy God. Because you are now reconciled. You're restored into a right relation with God. You are no longer hostile in mind before God. You are now holy and blameless and above reproach. Imagine two friends who have been fighting or having an argument. The good friendship with the good relationship they once enjoyed is strained to the point of breaking. They cease speaking to each other. Communication is deemed too awkward. We all have had those feelings, right? The friends gradually become strangers. And such estrangement can only be reversed by reconciliation. To be reconciled is to be restored to friendship or to harmony. When old friends resolve their differences and restore their relationship, reconciliation has occurred. And Paul says, you are now reconciled before a holy God. But how are we reconciled? You are reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is the way reconciliation occurs. The Colossians have been reconciled to the one with whom they had previously been an enemy of. Which could only be, which could only happen through God's intervention. By Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. The death of Christ is the basis of this. Is the decisive event by which we are reconciled before God. 
Christ's physical body was a means by which reconciliation was affected. We live in this world in Canada where the idea of Jesus dying on the cross, his blood being spilled for us is almost a negative thing. It's a, it's a doctrine that they're almost throwing out that Christ really didn't have to die on the cross. No, he did. It is the way in which we are reconciled. You can't throw that away. Christ had to die on the cross for our sins. To pay for us, to atone for our sins. Paul is insisting on the true incarnation. Jesus adding to himself humanity. And as he's doing this, he's also combating another heresy that Jesus physically didn't actually die. He did actually die. His heart stopped beating. Blood flowed out of him. He died and was buried. But three days later, he rose again. See, the Bible says that Christ reconciled us to God. We see this in Romans and 2 Corinthians and even here in Colossians. The fact that we needed reconciliation means that our relationship with God was broken. Since God is holy, we were the ones to blame. Our sin alienated us from God. Romans 5.10 says that we were enemies of God. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? The gospel message is an amazing message, but we have to include it all in order to make it know to be the good news. We need to share that there is a holy God and we've sinned against this holy God, the creator of the universe. And because of that sin, we were deserving of hell. But thank you for Jesus who came down to die for our sins. His blood was spilled for us. Because it's by his blood that we are reconciled. That we can be holy and blameless and above reproach. See, to be holy and blameless is the result of the reconciliation that Christ is now doing and has done on the cross to present you holy and blameless before God. The opposite of being hostile in mind, of being enemies of God, has now happened. You are now above reproach. When Christ brings his followers to the Father for inspection, they will be found to be above reproach. No longer through Christ's work do we stand before a holy God based upon ourselves but through Jesus Christ. To be above reproach is this judicial word, talking about a person or or a thing against which there could be no accusation and which we were free from reproach, without stain. The outcome of that is that no longer are you doing evil deeds, though. But you are now desiring the things of God. And Paul is envisioning the completeness of character appropriate to those who trust in Christ. Just because you are saved doesn't mean you get a license to continue in that life that you were saved from. God is best glorified among those who have cooperated with his working and whose lives reveal true Christian character. As we think about the, about the above reproach, it also echoes from the Old Testament sacrificial system. Christ, through his death and resurrection, makes us holy. He makes us blameless and above reproach. This does not mean that you don't stop sinning. I'm sure if you're like me, you probably did it on the way here. You're not perfect but we stand before a holy God based on Christ's work and not our own. But it also means that you're not left with a free get-out-of-jail card to do whatever you want. We have responsibilities as well. 
We have been justified by Christ's work and not our own. And because of that justification, we are called to a new life because we have a new life. Having been given a new life, we must behave in accordance with it. As as Paul again says in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Let not sin therefore reign, as he continues on in verse 12, in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. You are no longer alienated from God. You're no longer hostile in mind doing evil deeds. By the blood of Christ, you have now been reconciled to him to be holy and blameless and above reproach. Not only does that make our legal status before a holy God as a clean slate, but it also means we live in accordance to it. Our desires begin to change. What we desire is what God desires more and more and more. We begin to be sanctified more and more. Remember this. I've said this before. You cannot have an encounter with a living God and not be changed. Just as much as you can't have an encounter with a semi-truck and not be changed. Jesus offers certain salvation. And we have no reason to sway from the hope of the gospel. If you are his, you have been bought. You are no longer enemies of the living God. You are now adopted and called sons and daughters. You are his. And as his children, we are to act as his children. So who you were, who you are. And Paul continues on and says, this is who you will continue to be. As he says in verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You will continue as one who has been reconciled. If indeed you continue in the faith, This can be a tricky sentence as we look at it, right? Because it's a conditional statement. If, what? We can quickly think that we can lose our salvation when we read that passage. But the Greek translation more literally means provided that isn't casting doubt. The words in this sentence are more like, at any rate, if you stand before, if you stand firm in the faith, and I'm sure you will, As you continue in the faith, this is the test of reality. The Bible teaches that those who are born again will continue trusting in Christ forever. God, by his own power, through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, keeps or preserves the believer forever. This wonderful truth we see in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, where we see that believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to praise of his glory. When we become a Christian, when God calls us to himself, we receive the promise and dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. This is God's guarantee that he who began a good work will indeed continue the good work he promised to complete in you. God would have to break his promise or renege his guarantee, which he cannot do if you could lose your salvation. The believer is eternal secure because God is eternally faithful. Jesus offers certain salvation. And we have no reason to sway from the hope of the gospel. In John 5, 24, when Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
He who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of life into death. Notice that eternal life is not something we get in the future, but it's something that we have once we believe. This passage says that if we believe the gospel, we have eternal life and we will continue into it and not come into judgment. So it can be said that we are eternally secure. Not only will you continue in this, you will remain stable and steadfast as one who has been reconciled. They will be stable and steadfast. They will continue on. They will persevere. And Paul wants us as we do this to hold on to the gospel, to hold strong to the gospel. The Colossians are facing temptation all over the place. Anything that would entice them to change or or to, to believe in something else that could save them, something that may seem easier at this time. And Paul says, no, stay strong, stay, stay steadfast in the gospel. Hold strong onto it. Don't move to the left or to the right. Keep your eyes fixed upon the cross. Hold on to it with white knuckles. It's the gospel that will sustain us. The hope that it gives reminds us of who we are and who we are in Christ and enables us to persevere through any circumstances that may come our way. Paul calls on the Colossians to be steadfast in times of discouragement. And folks, we're in times of discouragement. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still flabbergasted by, by the Supreme Court decision with Trinity Western. Do you see it coming? What's going to get us through these hard times if it's not based upon the hope of the gospel? Being stead- stable and steadfast isn't based upon my physical comfort. It's based upon my eternal security. What is honestly going to get you through the hard times? Through the health concerns? Through the bullying at school because you spoke up for Christ? What's going to get you through it if it's not the gospel? Because biblically, I can't tell my child, here, here, it's okay. It's expected. Think about what is happening around us. This is why 1 Timothy 4.16 calls us to keep watch over ourselves. Don't move to the right or to the left. Keep your eyes fixed upon the cross to hold onto the cross with white knuckles. It is the gospel that will sustain us. It reminds us of who we were and who we are in Christ and enables us to persevere through any circumstances. How could Paul, being chained to a guy in jail, say all those things that he said while counting it all as loss? The joy that he has. Paul wants us to be grounded and steadfast as we think about the forgiveness and the redemption that Christ has accomplished in our lives. There's a great song by Ren Collective that says, Whatever Comes. It says this, Lord, whatever comes, make me steadfast, make me rooted, a cedar planted firm, deeply grounded in your goodness, whatever comes. How do we know that God is good? He saved a wretch like you. Lord, whatever comes, be my bedrock. Keep me stable, loyal to your throne. Whatever stands against me, whatever comes. Or the good old hymn, tie my wandering heart to thee. It's when we face the trials, the hard times, the loss of a job, the loss of loved ones, depression, difficult home situations, bullying at home, the list goes on. That we need to look to the gospel to remind us of who we were and who we are in Christ by his blood. 
I was once asked a question, how do you get through ministry? And I simply said to them, I preach to myself, sing to myself the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the only thing. What keeps us stable and steadfast is keeping our eyes on the cross, reminding us of who we were and who we are. Ultimately, those who remain stable and steadfast are the ones who God is persevering and will not shift from the hope of the gospel. Because as he continues on, he says that you will not shift when you keep your focus on the gospel. They must not shift from this hope. As Paul goes on, if the gospel teaches the final perseverance of the saints, it teaches at the same time that the saints are those who finally persevere in Christ. So Paul stressed believers' responsibility to remain faithful as people reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but your desires will be changing. Your attitude will be changing. How you view this world will change. Your purchases and what you buy and what you give will change. How in the world will you expect to go through the onslaught of what is about to come if we don't keep strong in the hope of the gospel? If we don't constantly remind ourselves and each other of what Christ has done for us, of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, it's why we, we must be in the word of God daily. And why we must be praying so that we're reminding ourselves that God is indeed a true God that keeps his promises over and over and over again. It's why we come together. It's why in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, do not give up meeting together. It's important. It's a commandment. Because we need to be reminded of what God has done for us. But not only will you not shift, no, not, only will you, will, not only will you remain stable and steadfast, you will proclaim the gospel that you have heard. This gospel is now being proclaimed to the ends of the earth as the Great Commission has commanded all disciples of Jesus to do. We live in a world that has no hope. None. What was it, two weeks ago? Two celebrities with seven-figure bank accounts kill themselves. They had everything that the world says. They had no physical needs. They had it all. That's what the world says. I was just listening to an interview about it. The people asking, why in the world would they kill themselves? They had seven figures in the bank. If I had seven figures in the bank, I wouldn't kill myself. I don't think you understand how hopeless you are. We live in a world that has no hope. The statistics of the rise of antidepressants are alarming. Even amongst kids. Folks, we have hope. We have it. For those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we have hope. The gospel keeps us stable and firm, but it enables us to go out into this world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, that yes, you are hostile in mind, that you are alienated, and your deeds are utterly evil against a holy God. But you, through Christ, can be holy and blameless and above reproach. If we really want to grow as Christians, part of our concern needs to be helping others grow in Christ. I don't understand how you can be a follower of Christ and not help other people follow Christ. It doesn't make any sense. We will be enabled to go out to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying you'd be like the crazy people on the go team. 
I'm waiting for him to smirk, but he's not. <laughs> it means you're going to walk across the street. It means you're going to talk to your friend at work. It means you're going to talk to, the, to, the, to the, your, your fellow students. Something I've learned about being a parent is that somehow as parenting, we take away that fire from our children to proclaim the gospel. Have you ever listened to a child as they're interacting with their friends, their neighbors? You ever see their boldness? They just don't care. They don't like me today. I'm just going to go play with somebody else. Somehow we deprogram that as we get older and we get afraid. No longer is there boldness in us. But the gospel, this reconciliation that we have experienced in Christ will enable us to proclaim the gospel to a broken world. How can we follow Christ and be a disciple of Christ and not help other people to follow Christ. A healthy church is marked by church members helping others follow Christ. This is what the local church should excel at. This is what Pineland should excel at. We should be a church that longs to see people called to God to be faithful to the call to proclaim the gospel. Helping people to follow Christ and grow in that relationship because Jesus and Jesus alone offers certain salvation in a world that has no hope. And because of that certain salvation, you and I, we have nothing to lose. We have no reason to be swayed from the hope of the gospel because it can't be taken away. They can take away everything. They can take away everything, but we still have everything. We were the nemesis to God. Enemies. People who are in constant rebellion against him. People who justly will be punished for rebellion forever. A theologian once, I think I've said this before, a theologian once reminded me, and I've been guilty of this myself, describing hell as the absence of God. I think that kind of makes it a little easier than it should be. The theologian described hell as the presence of God's wrath being poured out. I don't want my friends to be part of that. It's God who calls people to himself, but God has charged me to go proclaim the gospel. Paul focused on the person of Jesus to understand forgiveness. This is why we celebrate the birth of Christ. Not because a baby was born, but because Christ, being the fullness of God, took on human flesh and gave us the gift of forgiveness. As we take time to remember this this morning around this table, remind us of the beauty, I pray that God reminds us of the beauty of Christ and the wonder of forgiveness. Our lives are to reflect that forgiveness as people who are holy and blameless and above reproach. Our lives can be grounded on the foundation of Jesus and our faith fixed on him. Jesus offers certain salvation, and we have no reason to be swayed from the hope of the gospel. Let us pray. God, I pray that you would open my eyes and our eyes to the beauty of Christ and a greater understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done for the world. God, I pray that you would constantly remind us of your forgiveness and redemption, helping us to be stable and steadfast in our faith. I pray that we would continue to worship you as we reflect and remember this today around this table. Amen.